Good evening. Good evening and welcome everyone. My name is Tim Hubner. I'm the Sternberg Professor of History and Associate Provost at Rhodes College. And I'm coming to you um, this evening from my office here on the beautiful Rhodes College campus in Memphis, Tennessee. This is the second of a four-part series of webinars on COVID-19. Obviously, our nation has been in the midst of this crisis. Our entire planet has been in the midst of this crisis now for several months. And uh, Rhodes is going to um, try to bring to bear the expertise of our faculty in the areas of the liberal arts and sciences. Some of you probably saw the session last week moderated by our board chair, um, Carrie Fowler, on the science of COVID-19. Our session tonight, which will start in just a few moments when I introduce our panelists, will focus on history and literature. Um, uh, yet to come in this series, series um, A, as I said, a uh, four-part series, um, part three will be next Wednesday night at this same time, June 10th, and that session will be moderated by our president, Dr. Marjorie Haas, and um, next week's session will focus on the impacts of um, COVID-19 on health, education, and the economy. She will be um, joined by three Rhodes faculty members, Marshall Graham from economics, um, Kendra Holtz from the Department of uh, Religious Studies, and Dr. Aixa Marchand from uh, psychology. Um, the Wednesday after that, the fourth and uh, final part of our series will be moderated by Dr. Jeff uh, Bakewell. He will be joined by um, Dr. Patrick Gray from uh, Religious Studies, uh, Becky Klatskin from Psychology and Neuroscience, and our chaplain, the Reverend uh, Beatrix uh, Weil. And the topic of that uh, session on the 17th will be coping with COVID. So it's a series that uh, we offer through the Meeman Center for Lifelong Learning. Since 1949, the Meeman Center on the Rhodes College campus has been offering lifelong learning opportunities to those in Memphis. But of course now, through the wonder of uh, Zoom and um, of course the internet, we're able to broadcast to all of you um, no matter uh, where you are. If you're interested in those other sessions that I just mentioned, you can register for them in the same way that you registered for this session. Well, we are going to be speaking tonight about the theme of epidemics in history and literature. Disease, of course, has plagued humankind since ancient times. And we'll be talking tonight about everything from the plague of Athens to the AIDS crisis. We'll talk about uh, mosquitoes and the making of America. We'll talk about fear, isolation, and quarantine. We'll talk about uh, xenophobia, protest, injustices, inequities. We'll talk about uh, medical knowledge, uh, religious upheaval, and societal breakdown. And we'll talk about the stories that we tell ourselves about all of these things through both history and literature. A brief word about our format. We will hear from three presenters. Each of them will offer a short uh, presentation, followed by a few questions uh, by me. And then we'll open it up uh, to the audience. That's all of you out there who will have an opportunity to write your questions. And um, as you do that, we will uh, try to answer those as best we can. And then finally, after we work through your questions, I'll hope that our panelists will um, uh, you know, finally have an opportunity to talk with each other. So that's how our evening will go. And without further ado, I wanna to introduce to you our panelists. And I'll be introducing them to you in the order of their presentations. First, we'll be hearing from Dr. Joe Jansen. 
Dr. Jansen joined the Department of Greek and Roman Studies in 2005 after finishing his doctorate in Classics at the University of Texas at Austin, where he specialized in Athenian political and economic history and ancient historiography. When he's not teaching um, Greek and Latin language and ancient civilization courses, he um, can be found um, contributing courses to the Department of History, the Political Economy and Search programs, as well as the first year writing program. Um, this summer and this fall, he'll be offering a course on the history of nonviolent protest. Very timely. Um, and that um, course uh, came about as a research project on civil um, disobedience in ancient uh, Athens and his study of the writing and speeches of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Our second panelist tonight will be um, Dr. Tate Keller. Professor Keller is an associate um, professor of history and former chair of environmental studies and sciences here at uh, Rhodes. His research focuses on environmental change in times of crisis and conflict. With his interdisciplinary background in the humanities, social sciences, and natural sciences, he teaches a wide array of classes on environmental history. And one of his most popular offerings is a seminar on the history of disease and epidemics. I'll add that um, Dr. Keller will soon be taking over as the chair of our Department of History. And third and finally tonight, Dr. Chris Brunt. Uh, Dr. Brunt is a poet and fiction writer whose work appears in such venues as Plowshares, Poets.org, uh, Meridian, and other magazines. His first full-length um, collection of poetry, uh, Kingdom of Ends, was named a finalist for the 2018 Marsh Hawk Poetry Prize and the St. Lawrence, Lawrence Book Award. He's currently writing a novel about philosophy, slavery, and spies in the early Enlightenment. Um, this fall, he's teaching a course called The Literature of Plague. Well, let me turn it over to Dr. Jansen, who will start us off here tonight. Uh, Joe? Great. Thank you, uh, Professor Hubner, for that great introduction. And thank you all for being participants tonight. And I hope we can deliver a very informative and enlighten enlightened uh, presentation for you and hopefully a rich conversation. So I'm going to show some slides here. So we're going to start with the Great Plague at Athens, a plague that struck the Athenians in the year 430 BCE, one year after the beginning of the very destructive and long Peloponnesian War. The war that pit Athens and its allies against Sparta and her allies, and that lasted nearly 30 years. And it ended in 404 BCE with the defeat of the Athenians and the destruction of their fleet, and it ended the golden age of Athens. So our main source for this plague is the historian Thucydides, and this is his history right here. I'll be drawing from it uh, during, this, uh, during this presentation, and as you can see here on the slide, he noted that this plague was of foreign origin. It began in Africa, found its way up to Egypt, probably through the ports, eventually made, it way to the, made its way to the Greek world, to the port of Athens, as Thucydides says, and from the port of Athens up to the upper city, uh, the main city of Athens, where you can see the Acropolis. And it actually reached the Persian king's country, the Persian Empire. We know from Roman sources that it made its way to Italy, so we might want to think of this as a great pandemic, uh, in the fact that it uh, touched the whole Mediterranean world. So this plague was very destructive. It killed about a third of the Athenian population. Over the course of four years, there was a second wave and it didn't officially end until about 427, 426. 
It killed Pericles, the great architect of Athenian democracy and the Athenian empire. And we don't know what it was. Uh, researchers have studied this and uh, countless books and articles have been written. The scholarly, I wouldn't say consensus, but I would say there's a growing support for the idea that this was a typhoid fever. Um, there is some archaeological evidence to support that view. They have found in the dental pulp of uh, some, of some uh, exhumed bodies uh, evidence for that, but that study has recently come in, uh, into question, and so we're not exactly sure. In fact, just a few years ago when Ebola was uh, striking uh, Africa and actually made its way to the United States, if you remember, some people were struck by the similarity in the description that Thucydides gives uh, of the Athenian plague with that of uh, Ebola. They both uh, seem to have a, a hemorrhagic fever and the description that's the very vivid description I should add that Thucydides gives uh, did uh, lead researchers down that path and so articles were published on that as well. But for my purposes, uh, what is more of interest uh, to me and perhaps even Thucydides himself, uh, even though he went into great details about the disease, the symptoms, how it was spread, uh, how doctors took care of it, he was more concerned with the social, political, and cultural implications of the plague and the effects that those had on Athenian society. And it's those effects that he chronicles uh, in his account uh, that uh, ties into with a larger aim that he had in writing his history of the Peloponnesian War. And as you can see here from the beginning of his account in book one, is that he wanted his history to be useful for future uh, readers like ourselves. He wanted us to, to believe, as he did, that as long as the human condition, human nature really would be a more accurate translation, as long as that remained the same the events that he was chronicling would occur in the same fashion or nearly so in the future. So his text had become, has become very influential uh, when it comes to the writing about plagues. I gave you an example here on this slide of five uh, works that uh, explicitly uh, mention or allude to uh, Thucydides in some uh, significant way. Uh, both in the ancient world and, and in the modern world. And I think uh, Professor Brunt will maybe mention a few of these during his presentation. Uh, but it does speak to this kind of universal appeal that Thucydides history has. And in particular, uh, his account of the plague, which we now find ourselves in. And so it led me to the question of what were some of these universal themes or ideas that you see in Thucydides history that um, seem to be occurring now and those parallels are what uh, are what are very fascinating what interests me and I hope interest you as well. We can't look at all those so I just encourage you to uh, get a copy of Thucydides history it's online it's free and you can read his account in book two. Um, it's a fascinating read and I think you'll appreciate a lot of the parallels between uh, then and today. One thing I would like to uh, discuss or kind of go into a little bit more uh, detail is to talk about what Cohen refers to as this pandemic hate nexus. That is, it seems to be a facet of many plagues that hatred, especially hatred towards outsiders, foreigners, people of lower classes, tend to get demonized and ostracized during uh, epidemics like uh, the one we're currently in. And it almost seems to be a pattern that exists in many plagues throughout history. And you don't have to look very far. The Black Death was notorious for the uh, terrible treatment uh, of, of Jewish populations in Europe uh, who were scapegoated and believed to be uh, the main carriers of the disease in some parts of Europe. In the 19th century, the, um, uh, in British uh, India, the, uh, you know, uh, the Britons at the time really uh, saw this, uh, the cholera outbreak there as a true Indian disease, as something that was uh, passed and carried on by Indians in particular. They were noted uh, to, the, to the observers at the time to have, you know, reportedly to have uh, observed poor hygiene and therefore that they were the cause of this and, the, and, and, to, and to blame. Closer to home in the United States in the 19th century, there was actually an attack in 1858 on a marine quarantine hospital that was quarantining uh, immigrants for smallpox and cholera. 
And the rioters, this is actually from the New York Times, uh, broke down the gate there and uh, ransacked uh, this uh, quarantine hospital. And of course, today, Asian Americans have been victims of verbal abuse and assaults and even physical violence at times during this current pandemic. And uh, news has changed a little bit in the last uh, a few weeks, uh, but uh, you don't have to look far and dig very deep to find many examples of this today. So it was this reading about this kind of hate nexus and uh, that seemed to accompany plagues that got me uh, interested and, and it made me want to look a little further at the Great Plague at Athens and look a little deeper into Thucydides' account. And Thucydides' account um, doesn't really go into much detail about these things, but he does say one provocative thing. He said that people at the time thought that the Spartans, again, who, are, who was the enemy of the Athenians at the time, they're at a war, had uh, poisoned the wells and were the cause of the plague. So you can see a little bit of that scapegoating going on in Thucydides' account. I mean, it's not his view, he just reports it. It's hard to know how many people in Athens actually believe that or how long it persisted, uh, but it must have been enough for Thucydides to have mentioned it in his, uh, in his account. But what we don't find, interestingly, in both Thucydides and the historical record any account or descriptions of blaming immigrants, foreigners, resident aliens who were living in Athens at the time for the plague itself. And this should be kind of remarkable for a number of reasons, but in particular because the cities did say it came from a foreign source and it came up through Piraeus. And the Piraeus, the port town, was notoriously a place of foreigners, of people who didn't speak Greek, and uh, it would have been very easy for them to make that connection. And then another reason that's kind of interesting is that Thucydides, just before he delves into his uh, vivid and rich description of the plague, had just got done with uh, giving an account of Pericles' great funeral oration that he had delivered um, to extol the, the war dead for that particular year. And it turned into a great encomium uh, praise piece of Athenian democracy and culture. And one of the things he underscores in that, uh, among many things about Athenian democracy and culture, is their openness to the world. That they were an open society and they, they didn't expel foreigners like the Spartans. So it's interesting that when uh, Thucydides goes on and finishes the account and talks about what other parts of the Greek world uh, suffered from the plague, he does not mention Sparta. Uh, which was notoriously hostile to outsiders. And he definitely could have drawn attention to the fact that if there were uh, anti-immigrant sentiment going on in Athens, he surely would have mentioned it. Now, this is an argument of omission, right? We just don't know. Maybe that did occur uh, in Athens. We just, it just didn't make it to the historical record. And maybe it wasn't something that uh, interests people to, talk, uh, to, to comment on. But what we do find, and I don't want to go through these in any great detail, I'll just mention a few of them. But if we look at what the Athenians did in the immediate aftermath of the plague and the next several uh, decades afterwards, it actually shows the exact opposite. The Athenians stayed true to their openness and that their kind of love of, 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 foreign, of foreign things. One of the most important things they did was repeal a law that Pericles himself had enacted in 451 that made citizenship a requirement uh, for people to be born of both uh, parents uh, being Athenian citizens themselves. Previously, anyone could be a citizen as long as their father was a citizen. And if your mother was foreign born, you could be a citizen. But after 451, that all changed. And it seems to be the case that actually Pericles himself advocated for the repeal of this law in 429. In fact, we have evidence to support the idea that the Athenians actually uh, encouraged people to take on mistresses and, uh, and uh, have uh, children by other women, including foreign women, as a way to repopulate their city. The evidence for this comes in the 420s. That's kind of hard to date, uh, but generally in the 420s. Two cults of foreign goddesses were imported into the city, okay, again, just a year after the plague. And I think this is an interesting one because the Athenians, uh, in a lot of pagan religion, figured that if something like this happened, if, uh, if this disease was so terrible, it must be the cause of the gods. 
And if we try to propitiate the, goddess, the gods and goddesses, as Thucydides says the Athenians did, and nothing changed and the play continued, ergo, there must be some god or goddesses out there that we don't know about. And maybe we need to propitiate and to, and to worship them as a way to perhaps avert the plague. And that's what they did in 429. And then I'll just briefly comment on these last two. You can look at them um, just out of respect for my colleagues. I'll have them uh, start their presentations here shortly. But these last two pieces of evidence um, are also interesting because the medics, the resident aliens in Athens, were actually given a lot of freedoms. Now, again, not full citizenship, and that is definitely something that uh, we can talk about during Q&A. Uh, but they were given levels of freedom, for example, as uh, it's said here by this conservative observer by the name of the old oligarch, that's what historians refer to him as, that they gave them a, a, a lot of free speech and license in their way that they can talk to uh, full, you know, blooded Athenian citizens because of their worth as rowers in the Athenian Navy. And in 406, when they fought in a great battle of Arginusi, uh, they were promised, along with a number of slaves who also would have been foreign born, uh, they, would, they were promised citizenship if they rowed in the fleet. And uh, many of them, and we do have an inscriptions that prove this, were given citizenship. So I find this kind of fascinating. I think it merits more research. And uh, I think if we look at some other plague accounts, and as I started kind of looking through at some Roman plague accounts, the account of Procopius, uh, who gives the first uh, uh, account of the bubonic plague that struck uh, um, in the age of Justinian in the seventh century, uh, there is no mention uh, of, of any kind of anti-foreign sentiments. And so I'll leave it there, and we can maybe talk about it during Q&A if you're interested in this topic of why maybe the Athenians uh, treated uh, their, their outsiders with a little more respect than maybe some people are today. Thank you, Joe. I think you've um, certainly given us a lot to think about there. And uh, why don't I um, hand it off to uh, Tate Keller, who's going to um, talk about uh, some more history here, I think, for us. Tate? Great. Thanks, Tim. Thanks, Joe. That was fascinating. Give me a second here while I, I share my screen. I'm going to pull from uh, the seminar that Tim mentioned, this history of disease and epidemics, in which we, we cover this broad span of history, starting with ancient times, going all the way to the present. And we, uh, we tie a particular disease to a certain epoch in history to kind of Plus out what, what is actually happening there and what disease can, can tell us about that. I'm going to uh, illustrate that by giving us a quick and dirty look at the United States and show that um, disease has, has always been entwined with the U.S., especially with its establishment and with its political, social, cultural, and economic development, as well as environmental transformations. So I'll start us back here looking at the Caribbean. Uh, in the 1600s and into the 1700s. And the point that to raise here is this is where some of the great geopolitical struggles are happening amid landscapes that are uh, undergoing rapid environmental change. There's deforestation that's happening, there's soil erosion, and there's the installation of these plantation ecosystems, mostly with crops of, of sugar and rice. And what we find with these evolving ecologies there in the Caribbean and the American South is they are providing the ideal breeding grounds uh, for mosquitoes, in particular mosquitoes that carry two of humankind's most lethal diseases, uh, yellow fever, malaria. This is the Anopheles mosquito, and there on uh, the other side is the Plasmonium uh, parasite that causes uh, malaria uh, in humans. Once yellow fever and malaria became uh, common in the Americas, they created a, a differential immunity among people who live in these endemic areas and those who don't, and that carried political importance. So we're gonna find that mosquitoes played actually an important role in who won the American Revolution. So in their pursuit of human blood, they shaped human politics. So if we take a look here at a couple of one of the maps, with what we're seeing operations in the South during the American Revolution. We, oh, we see that the British are largely entrenched there in coastal cities. Uh, the Americans are, are having a pretty difficult time dislodging them. The Americans, on the other hand, the colonists, control uh, most of the countryside, and the British haven't been very successful in luring them into any decisive battles. 
In fact, it becomes part of American strategy to try to lure the British fighters, or the British army into engagement by pulling them farther away from the coast. Ultimately, this is gonna to lead to the British defeat at Yorktown, in part because British forces were far more susceptible to malaria than were uh, the American forces. Malaria is endemic to the region. We can see that on the other map with all that red, largely because of ecological changes that have been brought about by these plantation economies that created these great incubators for mosquitoes. Because of their repeated exposure to malaria that increased uh, immunity uh, to it and gave the Americans an advantage. One of the images that I like to show my class is this one. It's a painting of uh, Cornwallis's surrender at Yorktown. And what I like to point out with this is not the troops or the uh, supposed jubilant enslaved people celebrating this moment, but rather in the background, the landscapes that we had seen had been transformed uh, by these plantation economies that in fact played a really important role with these mosquitoes who uh, were partisan in this conflict. So, you know, if you're out there in the summer and you get bit by a mosquito, you could say America for these patriotic mosquitoes that created this, uh, helped uh, overthrow and kick out the British. We think about disease too, uh, and some of the large questions we ask in this is the uh, creation or the formation of community, but also the disintegration of community, something that, that Joe had touched upon in his talk. In the course, we also look at big questions of public good versus individual rights. We think about disease and its connection to the formation of individual identity. And the large overarching question that we often ask is whether disease in fact pushes progress along, encourages progress, or if it hinders progress and, and what that might mean. If we think, for example, uh, in the 1870s and we find ourselves in Memphis, and for those of you familiar with Memphis history in the 1870s, we know that in 1878, Memphis faced a massive outbreak of yellow fever. It was devastating for the city. It had come up from New Orleans and made its way up the Mississippi, uh, an important trading route. And um, it, 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 it devastated the city to the extent that a large, uh, large amounts of the population, if they could, left the city. Uh, those left behind, there were questions of quarantine, there were issues of uh, how one should live. There were these shotgun barricades that get built in various neighborhoods to keep people out. Um, it, it ravaged the city from about uh, the end of summer through mid-October. 90% of uh, white Americans who remain contacted yellow fever and 70% of them died. There was uh, a difference among African Americans they were long thought to have been immune to the disease, but they also contracted the fever in large numbers in the 1878 outbreak, but only 7% died. There's still no real consensus over why there's this racial diversity and mortality rates. It's suspected that uh, exposure across many generations of West Africans had built up some resistance uh, to the disease. So here we see on one side uh, an image of yellow fever victims and then the other side is a memorial to those who stayed in the city, the Memphis martyrs, to help out those who were suffering. In response to yellow fever, we find that there is a transformation, there's very ambitious reform, especially when it comes to sanitation. So Memphis developed this revolutionary sewer systems that then get exported out to other cities. Uh, the same thing happens in London, for example. Memphis is not unique in this, but Memphis is certainly a forerunner and shows us what sort of technological innovations actually can come out of this. Uh, disease also plays a role, and this is will connect to the other talks, uh, and deciding who belongs and who doesn't, who is a citizen and who is not. Here we'll see an image, uh, Ellis Island, which was used to uh, do extensive medical examinations on immigrants coming over to make sure that they were healthy enough to actually come into the United States. In touching on questions of xenophobia, we certainly see that 
uh, present in the U.S. with questions of disease. This was a, a popular cartoon. There we see down in the little boat, the Board of Health ready to fight off uh, this cholera that is personified, but what has to be this strange, very exotic, clearly was meant to tell the readership this is an, not an American, this is a, a foreign entity that's coming to invade the shore, and there's a clear militaristic response to it of what needs to be done to protect citizens. It, it also connects to the question of who is to blame. Uh, we see uh, also questions of government and the question of individual rights versus um, the public good. This comes to the fore in the 1918 flu pandemic uh, called the Spanish flu at the time because Spanish newspapers were neutral. This was a time of war. So Spanish newspapers were the one that broke the story. So then it became known as uh, the Spanish flu. It was global all around the world. Estimates vary, but it was massive. Uh, as high as 50 million people uh, died from this pandemic in 1918, 1919. We've, we've heard a lot of comparisons being made about it in the media. I'll just show you a couple images. You know, the masks here with them playing baseball, the uh, wards, emergency wards being set up to care for those who are infected. What's particularly noticeable, notable about this pandemic is the, the W-shaped mortality graph that it has. What's particularly curious is those who are in uh, the mid-20s to the mid-30s, what we would consider probably our healthiest citizens, were often the ones most stricken by this. It's uh, suspected that this particular flu created a, an intensified immune system response that actually ended up destroying the body rather than healing it. There is uh, questions of sexuality uh, that get connected to disease. Here are two propaganda posters from the Second World War warning soldiers to avoid uh, dangers like this so-called bag of trouble or this juke joint sniper, the idea that Clearly women are dangerous here. They're the carriers. They're the ones to blame for the spread of this. So there's misogyny that then becomes very evident, uh, particularly in this propaganda. Uh, this comes to the fore also uh, during the age of AIDS uh, when it becomes a question of blame, uh, marginalized portions of the population that become easily targeted for this. And finally, even still today, where disease uh, illuminates inequalities and vulnerabilities uh, in among uh, here in the country. And this is, this is not unique to the United States, but the United States offers a good example of this. And what we find is that disease is not necessarily creating these divides, but it, it's certainly revealing them and throwing them into sharp relief. Uh, there's probably a lot there for, for us to ponder, so I'll leave it at that. Thanks so very much. Yes, thank you, Tate. Much to ponder there, and we'll have time to think through the issues that you've been raising. Um, thank you, and let me turn it over to uh, Chris. Thanks, Tim. Hi, everybody. I'm Dr. Chris Brunt, Assistant Professor of English here at Rhodes, and I'm really happy to be here tonight with my colleagues and with you all in the audience. I'm gonna go ahead and um, get my screen share going. So I was asked to join this panel primarily because I teach a course called The Literature of Plague, um, which I'll be running this fall when we resume. And this is a course that I developed when I taught at the University of Houston Honors College in their Medicine and Society program. And some of the students with whom I piloted the course are now working their way through medical school. Um, or even their residencies. And a number of them have recently gotten in touch with me and uh, told me that they found themselves in quarantine um, very recently rereading Saramago's Blindness or Camus' The Plague and finding that, yeah, this stuff isn't, uh, isn't just theoretical anymore. We can see our own lived and felt experience in the pages of Thucydides or in a 20th century French novel. Um, that the questions about the human experience that these texts raise are with us now. There are questions and perhaps painfully at the center of our own lives. Um, I expect when I teach the course again this fall, it's going to necessarily have to adapt to this moment. And we're gonna talk a lot about what we've all been through 
uh, in these last few months, what has been going on in our own communities and across the world. And we'll be sitting six feet apart and wearing masks, I expect, which will be very on the nose for this class. Um, so the first thing that I ask students to think about in my course is this notion of the plague in ancient and biblical literature as a tragic instrument. Um, basically a missile that God or the gods throw down at us, either in um, punishment for something that we did or just because they can. Um, think here of the God of Exodus wielding the tools of his creation to overwhelm Pharaoh and to lift his people up out of Egypt. So this is the first paradigm that we track through a number of texts, the Torah, the Iliad, Oedipus the King, the Aeneid, plague as a divine weapon. Until we come to Thucydides um, and his history of the Peloponnesian War, which uh, Joe um, told us a lot about. So where we get in Thucydides, not just a historical, but really a secular account of the plague that centers on reportage of medical knowledge, uh, societal breakdown, the violation of political, ethical, and religious norms um, as the city succumbs to the virus. This becomes the next paradigm until we reach the Black Death of the 14th century, where I think it's possible to see both paradigms working and engaging each other at once, both as contemporaneous narratives and on the level of history itself, as the social and political upheaval feeds into the religious upheaval and vice versa. Now that's just the first couple of weeks um, because for the majority of class, we're looking at modern literary accounts of the plague. We're looking at um, Boccaccio's Decameron, Camus' The Plague, Tony Kushner's Angels in America, and Saramago's Blindness, um, and seeing how they ask different questions than the texts from antiquity and therefore engender new paradigms. Um, modern literature from Defoe onward gives us the journal of the plague year. It gives us the political parable it gives us post-apocalyptic fiction. If there's a through line in the class for all of these texts and all of these paradigms, it's something that we see most explicitly in Boccaccio's Decameron, which is the notion of storytelling as a tool of survival. A tool to remind us who we are in the worst possible times, or perhaps to discover who we really are underneath the self-image we've cultivated in less perilous times. You might know that the wonderful 14th century text of Boccaccio's begins with an incredible description of the plague in Florence that echoes Thucydides' account, after which a group of noble men and women flee the city for a villa in the countryside where they go into quarantine and tell tales to each other to pass the time. And this is actually the frame of the book. It's the tales that they're telling, which become the individual chapters that make up the body of the Decameron. So what I'll be asking my students next fall and what I hope that we'll talk about some more here tonight is what stories are we telling each other right now during the coronavirus pandemic? What do those stories reveal about who we are and what we care about? Um, for the next five minutes, I'm gonna try to offer one answer. So for the first few months, it seemed like escapist entertainment was all we were capable of uh, if we weren't glued to the news becoming armchair epidemiologists. I'm sure, um, oh, I'm sorry, there's Boccaccio. I'm sure some of our audience is familiar with Mr. Joe Exotic here, the first cultural phenomenon of the coronavirus. Um, I'm not going to subject you to a post-structuralist analysis of the Tiger King, um, except to say that Carol Baskin killed her husband. Following the Tiger King, we had a resumption of our national obsession with the familiar and beloved figure, Dennis Rodman. And this other guy, Michael something. So 90s nostalgia, absurd reality TV escapism. This may indeed speak to part of who we are, but clearly I think these were primarily ways to divert ourselves. Just like the body tales in the Decameron serve as a kind of comic nourishment for Boccaccio's tale tellers and for his audience, who themselves were living through the Black Death. Because the real stories that captured our attention and energy and emotion, I think, have been the deadly serious narratives found in our journalism and nonfiction writing, in grand eloquent Twitter threads, in the daily reporting of the national and global response to the pandemic itself. Um, in the social and economic inequities and injustices that the pandemic has laid bare. And in the many expose of the, exposés of the government's failure to adequately address this crisis. 
The stories that we began to tell each other were about the gross inefficiencies of our healthcare system and the economic disarray that has cost lives and livelihoods. Above all, we've been telling stories of injustice. This is a passage from Germaine Brie's Albert Camus and the Plague. And I apologize if we're not all able to see it properly, but I'll read it to you now. The appearance of plague organizes all that is bad in human life into a coherent and independent system, pain, death, separation, fear, and solitude. And it disorganizes and destroys all that is good, freedom, hope, and most particularly, love. The people of Iran are easily led to accept the plague as the very form of reality. It does not develop as would any living organism. It spreads monotonous, rigid, inhuman, occupying a city which, because of its lack of awareness, is already conquered. This for me captures something about the national conversation in the first few months of the pandemic. That sense of solitude as we sheltered in place, glued to the news with no end in sight. The sense that the coronavirus had blanketed the whole world, not just as a medical phenomenon, but as a cultural one, as a temporal one. In my house, it destroyed the notion of days of the week. And not in a fun every day is Saturday kind of way, but in a does anything really matter anymore kind of way. Camus calls plague the most alienating event in the human experience. I think of those people suffering from COVID-19 alone in hospitals, dying without their loved ones at their side. Think of the trauma of seeing just how unequal and how broken so much of our society is all at once and not being able to congregate with friends and neighbors and colleagues to process that and come together and rectify things or heal in any way. Remember that coming into May, we were at this terrible plateau of new cases and deaths for weeks on end, upwards of 2,000 a day, every day for weeks as people sheltered in place and lost their incomes and savings and businesses. And if you're a parent like me, with no schools, daycares, babysitters, or playgrounds open, you probably lost your mind over this period too. But then came the next story. A very old story, but coming as it did in the context of wall-to-wall -wall pandemic coverage, I think it registered as an abrupt and total changing of the subject. The video of the Ahmad Arbery lynching by two white men in Georgia was released. Then reporting about Breonna Taylor's murder by Louisville, police began to filter through. The Christian Cooper video from Central Park goes viral. And finally, the murder of George Floyd in Minneapolis and that footage, a match on all of that kindling. People poured into the streets in spite of the pandemic and began to mobilize and they were met with a vicious response from police departments from Minneapolis to Brooklyn to Los Angeles to DC. Those same police departments that have been offenders in these types of incidents time and time again and have produced so much of that social inequality in our society by their over-policing assault and killing of black people. By the time of George Floyd's murder by Minneapolis police officers on May 25th, the news was overwhelmingly dominated by the national uprising against his killing and against police brutality and white supremacy in the United States. Think about this with me for a minute. Would you have thought it possible back in April that in May, we would be talking about something other than the coronavirus? That the headlines of the Washington Post and New York Times and the commercial appeal here in Memphis would not have the words COVID or virus or ventilator or vaccine in them. I wanna be clear, I think that this is as it should be. That's the brother of George Floyd on your screen, by the way. Our colleague, Dr. Charles McKinney, spoke about this on the local Fox affiliate on Monday night. The protests and uprisings we are seeing are the result not only of decades of disempowerment and impression in black communities all across America, but the fact that their voices have not been heard. Their calls for justice and reform have not been taken seriously by those in power. And that was certainly still the case as COVID-19 spread through black communities in an alarmingly disproportionate rate and took the life of one in 2,000 black Americans in only three months. Right now, we're seeing black Americans dying at three times the rate at which white Americans are dying from this virus. Three times the rate. Why is that? 
because of the effects of structural anti-Black racism at every level of our society, from the healthcare system, to mass incarceration, to economic inequality, to the burden of stress that Black individuals cope with in their daily lives that leads to measurably worse health outcomes, diabetes, hypertension, heart disease. For a week and a half now, the stories we're telling each other are about police brutality, racial injustice, white supremacy. And why? Because our screens are filled with images of flames and smoke and cops in riot gear. So this isn't just civil society coming apart at the seams in the midst of a pandemic, like in Thucydides. Part of this chaos is tactical, is intentional, and is necessary. When you are a marginalized community, civil disobedience is the only tactic that gets the attention of the power structure. Here in America, this has always been so. Minneapolis, where George Floyd was murdered and where this uprising began is the city where Philando Castile was murdered by police and where the officer who killed him was acquitted on all charges. It's a city where the police union is so strong they can defy direct orders from their mayor, where they've made it very difficult to fire officers for misconduct and very easy for officers who have lost their jobs to get them back through arbitration. The police officer who killed George Floyd, for example, had 18 separate complaints of excessive force lodged against him. It's a city where the police union's president, Bob Kroll, has been the subject of nearly 30 different complaints of racial discrimination to the city's official review board. And that's just in this one community. But that sense of entrenchment of police departments being above accountability, not being bound by law or checked by democratic institutions, of citizens having no recourse whatsoever, that's felt in communities in every corner of this country. I think it's worth noting how many storytellers have risen to this moment, both in the ranks of the professional media and citizen journalists using social media to broadcast events in real time, especially incidents involving the excessive use of force by police and the suppression of people's civil liberties and their rights to peacefully protest. This is the first time in my lifetime the media has covered police brutality like this. That might have something to do with the fact that the media themselves have become targets. Seeing the brutality of the police in real time in response to these protests against police brutality, driving SUVs into crowds, blocking off streets so people cannot disperse and the panic ensues, setting off flash bombs in crowded spaces to cause stampedes, firing rubber bullets at journalists and pregnant women, pepper spraying an Ohio congresswoman, those college kids in Atlanta pulled out of their car and tased and terrorized. All of this captured on social media has only confirmed for anyone who watches the indictment that has been made against them. And that it, in this way, this echoes um, the civil rights movement of the 1960s. It's made it very difficult to be a person who espouses values like liberty and equality and democratic governance and condone what you're seeing on your screen every night. As always in any uprising, there will be a tremendous cost and tremendous suffering that people bear and that entire neighborhoods bear. But in these ways, these protests and the bravery of the people out there in the streets risking their bodies have been vindicated and they have been successful up to now. Many activists that I've heard from do not think that this time is like all of the other times in the past. They don't necessarily think things will just go back to normal, which sort of echoes the rhetoric of coronavirus discourse that whatever was normal before was an intolerable state of affairs. To return to the status quo ante is neither possible nor desirable. And you can see that desperation, not just in the protesters, but in the crackdown itself. Something is different this time and that something is the plague that we're still living through. This is the first time in my lifetime that this has happened. Washington burning, the White House gone dark. This is the first time I've seen Army Black Hawk helicopters buzzing over the heads of citizens in the streets of DC. This is the first time I think any of us have seen a president stand in the Rose Garden and announce he's preparing to invade his own country with the US military. Last night, there were 60,000 people in the streets of my hometown, Houston, Texas. And I can tell you, having been a part of protest movements there going back a few years, that is an astonishing amount of Houstonians to gather anywhere besides the rodeo or a Beyonce concert. 
I'm concerned uh, about the spike in COVID cases we might see in places where uh, lots of people have been jailed, especially cities where they're just warehousing hundreds of protesters together overnight in close indoor quarters. And of course, there's still a risk that people gathering outside chanting and yelling are going to be spreading the virus amongst themselves. And that risk is exacerbated when you have police firing tear gas into crowds every single night, um, obviously inducing far more coughing than we want to even think about right now. It's a terrible irony that people are having to face both of these dangers at once, the coronavirus and the violence of a militarized police force. It's an unforgettable spectacle to see these two related crises merge and expand into the same crisis. I wish people didn't have to be in harm's way. Unfortunately, there really is no other choice. I wanna note that researchers at the University of Washington, the same medical researchers we've been relying on for some of the big headline studies and the best data on the pandemic, published an open letter last Sunday that said this, Protests against systemic racism, which fosters the disproportionate burden of COVID-19 on black communities and also perpetuates police violence must be supported. Another way of saying this is that anti-black racism has been a public health crisis for much, much longer than the coronavirus has been around and we cannot wait to address it as a collective, as a nation. Here is Camus on the act of rebellion. And I think this stands as an interesting counterpoint to the way he describes the alienation of the plague. When he rebels, a man identifies himself with other men and so surpasses himself. And from this point of view, human solidarity is metaphysical. If we can't find a more just way to organize our society, if we can't eradicate the virus of white supremacy from this nation's institutions and its seats of power, then we will continue to consume ourselves and the stories that we'll be telling, much like Thucydides' account of the plague in Athens, will be how this was just the beginning of the end. And on that very cheerful note, Tim, I hand it back to you. Thank you, Chris. Um, and um, thanks to all of you, you've given us so many things to think about. I hope if you're watching at home that you will send in your questions. Um, now is the time to do that. Um, a number of um, you know, themes emerge, it uh, seems to me, certainly in the most generalized sense, all of you were talking about social change, societal upheaval. That's obviously taken uh, different forms uh, in different um, you know, times in different places. It seems like Joe offers us a uh, sort of look at the uh, you know, plague of Athens that seems to open up uh, society in maybe ways that hadn't been possible before. Um, um, Tate raises the really big sort of question for us about does um, disease or an epidemic, does it hinder progress or does it help progress along? I think maybe that, um, you know, given what um, you know, Chris has just uh, offered to us, maybe that's the place to start. Obviously, um, the uh, pandemic that we're in the middle of right now has augmented all of the inequalities, um, all of the inequity, all of the injustices that we've seen in our society. Um, and that's, um, a uh, sort of big part of the story, as uh, you know, Chris has just um, explained to us. Um, and so I want us maybe to think about that uh, bigger question of what, what progress might end up sort of coming out of this um, important moment, this, this moment of great upheaval, as you know, Chris has outlined, some of the scenes that we've seen in the news in the last uh, week or so, we couldn't have imagined. And as um, you know, Chris has said, we even uh, could not have imagined that um, a month ago we would be talking about anything other than the virus. And yet it seems to be this moment when these two things have come together. So, so maybe sort of building on that bigger sort of question of whether anything positive, whether progress is possible, maybe we should start there and uh, I'll sort of open it up for any of you to talk about that issue. Well, 
Well, I was particularly struck by, um, Chris, what you just said there at the end and coming back to Camus and the rebel. And uh, I'm a big fan of existentialism and that's what I read in my spare time. And I, you know, went back to look at the plague last month and, um, an amazing work and I'm jealous that you get to teach it uh, every year. It's uh, a lot there and I, you know, for people who are planning to read it, I won't uh, give away too many details, but it's interesting per your question, Tim, I mean, just how do you confront the absurd and for the doctor and for these characters in Iran, eventually sooner or later they come around to the idea that they can not escape and they find meaning in fighting the virus. And I think maybe right now for a lot of people fighting systemic racism and being out there is giving them purpose, something to do that's of a higher calling that uh, is giving meaning to their lives. Um, I just throw that out as a question, maybe a speculation. I mean, does that resonate at all with you? Is that to me, Joe? Just something you do. Sorry, yeah, no, that was to you. Yeah, I mean, uh, people should absolutely go. If you can find a copy of Camus' The Plague, I understand it was sold out there for a while in the first few months of the pandemic. Amazon ran out of copies, uh, but check with your local bookstore. Um, what's incredible is how realistic it is. You know, it is a really uh, believable account. And there's nothing fanciful about it at all. There's nothing romanticized about it. Um, it's very much a, a realist text. And you get all of this range of responses, right? The sort of range of emotional and psychological responses to what can be done in such a hopeless situation um, and what this all means and, and, and how this uh, destabilizes everyone's sort of belief system or nearly everyone's belief system. It changes who people are. Um, by the end of the novel, you see people have sort of, um, uh, profoundly altered their characters in some cases, but you know, um, do you remember how it ends, Joe? We don't want to give anything away, but you know, there's that that sense that you know, um, I'm, I'm swatting a fly. Sorry. Um, if we were live, I wouldn't do that. But in my house, I have, there's a fly. I, it's a reflex. Um, you know, there's that sense at, at, at the end that that. Uh, that it's our responsibility to decide what this means and and how the, and how um, and our, our interpretation of of what has happened has to you know um, morally bound, bind us to action. Um, so you know, Tim, I don't know if that's cause for optimism. I think it's cause for responsibility. Um, that that. Um, this crisis and the the crisis that precedes it and undergirds it uh, um, with racial injustice in our country, um, we don't have a choice, right? We don't have a choice but to um, but to begin to um, to rectify this. And so it's I think it's it's just it's our responsibility. I don't know how else to say it. What do you think, Tate? No, I, I think so too. And I was, as I was thinking about, so I was thinking about everything that was being said, you know, this, it brought me back to the point of, of it's, it, it, it's something greater than the individual. So even though it feels profoundly individualistic because we're, we're stuck isolated in a way, but it, it brings this larger connection to something that's bigger than just one person, which resonated with, with some of those quotes that you had. And I think, for a lot of folks, that, that's exactly where they find the meaning, where it's something bigger than themselves that they can connect to in, in really meaningful ways. I mean, to see, to see the energy right. Right, over the last week and a half, it, it's stunning, given you know, how lethargic everything has felt since March, right? Since early March. Um, you know, just bro like broadly, nationally, I mean, uh, I think if you live in New York City or some communities, um, uh, we were fairly lucky here in Memphis to not have a sense of, you know, chaos in the air. Um, but the sort of out of the gate energy that, the, that this uprising had from the, from the very beginning, um, I think speaks to that, that power of solidarity um, that, you know, 
was it was not dormant during the uh, the first few months of this um, coronavirus. It just hadn't been sort of tapped yet. Right. Well, we're starting to get some questions um, coming in, so maybe we'll we'll start to uh, work through some of these. Uh, here's a question: After the immediate effects of the pandemic or plague, how did uh, societies explain what had happened, and how did they frame the transition to the recovery or the next stage? How have societies emerged from moments uh, such as this? Well, I would, my, my immediate thought is that when they do emerge, and then the second thought that I had is, is when we're talking about, because I think that's going to be a large determinant about these, the explanations that people will use to understand what was largely beyond comprehension. So we're going to, we're going to see, you know, this, this came out with, in, in Joe's talk with thinking about the gods and who is responsible for this sort of thing. Eventually, as we get into the late 19th century and in the early 20th century, the reliance on faith begins to shift to science for a, an explanation. And then also looking for uh, a strategy or a plan on how one comes out of it. You have to, the thinking is to, to look at those who know to be able to tell us. Uh, so then it becomes this question, power of knowledge, and then who gets to know and what they what they then decide. We have, Chris, oh, yeah, please go ahead, Joe. No, I was just gonna say, Chris, you know, do you wanna to give too much of the ending away, but there is a sense at the end of the plague that the citizens just wanted to get back to their lives. And uh, even though they came together and uh, went through a horrific one year plus uh, devastating, uh, you know, plague that they uh, wanted to get back to normal quickly. And uh, that's something I think we have to, you know, as much as we want to be there and be back to normal, and we all say that, whatever that means, um, we have to make sure we're <laughs> going to not repeat those same mistakes of the past. Learn from history. I know it's a platitude. Maybe it's one truism in history is we don't learn from history. Uh, but certainly that's something we need to bear in mind and come back to these literatures and these uh, historical precedences for some guidance. I tend to be I tend to be quite pessimistic about things, and I find that with the end and the emergence of something new, it's it's actually all very mundane. People go back to work, they go back to the lives that they were attempting to lead before. Maybe there is some changes of mentality, but I don't know. Uh, a few more questions um, coming in, uh, maybe building on what was just said. Uh, what is the new normal that we should uh, prepare ourselves for? So Tate, um, you, know, you mentioned folks just going, going back to how things were, but uh, it, it you know, seems that there has been a lot written about how it's going to take a while and maybe it won't be as it simply was before. And then also kind of a, uh, a sort of follow-up there you know, in that same question. And maybe this speaks to the fact that the, that the death of George Floyd and the protests uh, surrounding that have happened at the same time as the virus. The second part of the question is, is America a failed social um, experiment? So that sort of uh, two-part question, what is the sort of new normal and in, in what does that say about America? Big questions. It is a big question. Good Lord. Um, where do you begin? It's, uh, I think, something we're all contemplating. I think we're, um, we try to, as Chris just pointed out, try to make sense of this and the storytelling. And there's a moment here. I do believe, um, I think I would agree with Chris and the protesters on this, that, um, that this is different, that maybe this is a tipping point, that uh, if we do achieve some lasting changes in this country and vis-a-vis uh, -vis the question of race, I think that that's gonna heal the country. I think it's gonna be ugly for a while. And certainly I think, you know, it's gonna be 
some dark days ahead. It's a you know tough conversation to have, and uh, but I think we're going through it, and I think it's been productive. So I think that's a start. So I mean, uh, failed social experiment. Um, you know, if King is right, and if these racism, if you know, and and Jim Crow, these you know, what was the metaphor he used? He's talked about the death throes, right, of a dying system, and we're in the death throes in the 60s, and maybe we're just uh, back at it, right? Uh, at the bitter end, I don't know, but I just, I have to be hopeful. We have a um, question about uh, uh, the tendency for scapegoating during uh, uh, pandemics in and uh, wondering if some of you might elaborate a little bit more about that, you know, sort of, I mean, it sounded like Joe was, was offering us an um, example of a moment in time when there wasn't necessarily scapegoating for the plague in Athens, but that seems to be an outlier, if I'm correct, in kind of the history of disease and epidemics, Tate, is that? I think that's right. And I think Tate touched upon this too. I mean, the, I think you're going to find way more examples of the scapegoating and the xenophobia, anti-immigrant sentiment uh, during these times, and you're going to find uh, counter examples. Now, antiquity might be the outlier because of the lack of uh, sources, aren't as rich and well-documented, um, but it also may have to do with the fact that in antiquity, we don't have the same kind of racism uh, that we have today in the modern age. And I think that is a significant factor in all this. Um, the Athenians, the Greeks were, um, could be xenophobic and they certainly were. They were ethnocentrist who believed their society was the greatest, was they were better than the people of the East and Persians. There's no doubt about that. But we, we don't see as the kind of racism and institutional racism, which I think comes into a play here and is really exacerbated in the modern era. Yeah, I, th I think that's right. And, um, you know, it connects back to another, to another one of those great quotes that, that Chris had in that in some ways these, these epidemics, these plagues, these outbreaks are going to bring out the worst, the darkest aspect of human nature. And as, as a communal organism, we're going to look for what it is to who's responsible for inflicting this pain, this suffering, this grief, all this death. Uh, so you, it's, it's a, it's a response to point a finger and be able to point a finger at something that's, that's concrete uh, and something that you can see and then something that's easily targeted. Marginalized groups, outsiders, people who look different, people who act different, people who talk differently. Don't you think like the, the attempt to, uh, to use that tactic in our national politics um, ha has been more or less a failure hmm. this time? I mean, it just, I don't know. Uh, I don't know how to measure that or gauge that, but it just doesn't seem like too many people were persuaded um, by, by those who were trying to persuade them mm -hmm. that this is, for instance, China's fault or that it was from a lab in Wuhan or what have you, right? I just, I just didn't sense that that was catching um, the way we might fear. Um, I, don't, I, I don't know what to attribute that to other than perhaps the messenger. Um, well, what do you guys think? I mean, do you think that I'm maybe underestimating how, how uh, pernicious that was? Mm. Yeah, I'm the wrong person to ask. Um, <laughs> right, you just read the stories and that's all we have, right? And it's hard to measure um, what Asian Americans are going through. Our students have gone through, especially as they travel this summer, some trying to get home, moving around the country. Um, yeah, just the, the conversation is, uh, you know, changed and the news has changed so rapidly that we kind of lost that. So it's hard to, it's hard to know. The, the, the fact that it did happen was, was not surprising whatsoever. Understanding that this is, this is what often happens. But I mean, the access to information about disease, about epidemiology now, the fact that it's just right here in our hands at all times and we're all scrolling constantly. Um, I think might make that that scapegoating exercise more difficult perhaps than in the past, mm. right? That's not to say that it's not still dangerous and, um, and malevolent, mm. but, um, but it may be at least slightly less um, effective on a broad scale.
And sort of building on that, here's, here's an interesting question, maybe offering another point of view on one of the uh, consequences of the epidemic. Uh, is it possible that the pain experienced individually and collectively has created even more empathy as witnessed now in the protests and horror over the killing of George Floyd? I think that's exactly right. I, I really believe, I mean, that's sort of why I wanted to um, conclude with that quote from the rebel that solidarity is metaphysical. Um, you know, I think that this shared suffering, um, you know, can only increase our, uh, our empathy. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, we've been seeing protests against the police murder of unarmed black Americans for, for decades, um, but certainly at a heightened intensity since the death of, um, of Mike Brown. And um, yeah, it does, seem, it does seem like that there are more people out in the streets than ever before. Um, and the, again, I think you can measure the, um, the power of a movement by the uh, power of the backlash against it, right? Or the intensity of the, of the crackdown on it. And that is also at an all time high, at least um, again, in my um, very short lifetime, I would say, very brief lifetime. Um, here's a question uh, specifically for Joe Jansen. Um, and, uh, you know, Joe, you sort of hinted at this earlier that, that uh, you might be willing to answer the sort of why question if it were to come up. But how did Athenians counter the hate nexus tendency um, in that moment of the uh, you know, plague in Athens? I appreciate the question. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm going to have to think more about this. Um, but it's something that... Uh, it's something they worked through collectively, and they did that uh, to come back to Chris's point with their storytelling. If you look at a lot of the tragedies that were told before the, this incident, during this time period in the 420s, all the way down uh, to the end of the Peloponnesian War, I'm thinking of Euripides' Ion. Um, these are plays about status and about who is who, and it's about um, what's your worth as a citizen? What happens if your parent is not uh, a hero? And they perform these tragedies every year in front of the whole, the, you know, whole population. I mean, there were women, there were um, some children there. I'm sure that predominantly it was the men, but uh, we do have information from Plato that suggests that many Athenians were, were a part of this experience and it is part of their civic education. So I, I'm gonna just stop there and just kind of just to piggyback on what, you know, Chris's thesis, I do think that their storytelling helped them work through some of these things and made them reevaluate some of their positions. Joe, do we know if the plays were performed during plague years? We do. In 429? I think we do, yeah. They were. Yeah, I mean, we have a list of winners. I'll have to double check that, but I do, from my memory, I, I believe they're, they, they were a play in Ford. Yeah, because, you know, the plague, when it starts in summer, the, the, the um, you know, plays would have been, the, at least at the city of Dionysia, would have been, you know, early, very early spring, late winter, right? So the plague hadn't hit the first year, and then the following year, you know, it, it, they were on the downside, the back end of the curve, to put it in modern. <laughs> Is there like an asterisk next to the winner on plague years? Like, I'll look into that. Like a lockout shortened season kind of thing? <laughs> we have another question that has come in about uh, how we understand science and scientific literacy and expertise. Um, is the current uh, uh, sort of way that we're talking about science and our understanding of science and scientific expertise, is that uh, consistent with previous examples of uh, plagues, uh, specifically in the history of the United States? Well, it's, 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 it's far more widespread and, and much, in a sense, more easily digestible. There's all kinds of various platforms now that, 
that people can have access to this. It's social media, it's the radio, it's TV, it's, it's looking on the internet. So in that sense, I think it, it's, it's far, far more extensive uh, for what people are able to access in terms of uh, understanding science behind uh, disease and epidemics than it had been in the past. It's still interesting though, when it, when it comes down to questions of authority and who has authority and who doesn't when it comes to determining the flow of knowledge. Um, we have a, a question from um, Marjorie Haas, president of Rose College. And uh, Dr. Haas writes, all three of you have commented on the way that plague is both a biological phenomenon and a metaphorical device. This week, we've even seen references to the two plagues of our current time, COVID-19 and racism. What are your thoughts about this metaphorical usage? Does that illuminate? Does that help to shed light? Or is that, how should we understand that sort of um, pairing or that sort of metaphorical usage? I hope it doesn't include, since I, I, I made the metaphor several times in my presentation, the notion of eradication, uh, the notion of white supremacy as a virus. Um, I, I find that illuminating. I don't, you know, I don't know that it is for everyone, but um, the notion that, it, that there is some degree to which it is contagious. Yeah. Um, and, that, and that its spread has to be countered in that way. Um, I, I don't know, I wanna stop there and hear from Tate and Joe. Was the, what, the thought that comes to my mind is in, in some ways it makes something that might be for many of us incomprehensible a, a way to understand it, you know, understand disease and the spread of disease and what that entails. So using that then as a metaphor for these other uh, uglier aspects that are, are rife throughout uh, our society might be a way to, to grapple with it. Yeah, I think the, the question you know, comes from place maybe Susan Sontag's essay, Illness as Metaphor, which I will have to now reread, right? Um, kind of a double-edged sword in both respects. I mean, just again, from my unlimited experience and frame of reference, um, Thucydides absolutely did use it metaphorically to kind of show the, to balance, as I mentioned earlier, the, the greatness of Athens as is extolled in this funeral oration, coupled, you know, paired in this juxtaposition with the plague was to show the fissures. Of, of the Athenian Empire, of their perceived greatness, and to show how vulnerable they were. Um, and ultimately, you know, in their situation, through, uh, Pericles then in the follow-up speech, you know, says that this plague has made you think about yourselves, your individual circumstances, and you're, you forgot about how to act um, for the collective good. And, uh, but now what we're seeing is something that runs counter to that. If, you know, Chris and I think we're, what we're seeing in this country is, is people coming together and trying to do something um, for, for the greater good. So that's inspiring. I won't be pessimistic like Tate. <laughs> I think in some way, I mean, to get back to, you know, the question of metaphor, I, I think we're trained in some ways by the literature to, to make those connections and to, and to think about plague as, as a, a metaphor for other kinds of human experiences. I mean, um, there was actually a really great essay in the New Yorker just a couple of weeks ago by Jill Lepore, and it was about um, it was about plague lit. It was uh, it was right up my alley, and she mentioned a lot of the texts that we've discussed here tonight. And she said it was a really great sentence. She said, "Every plague novel is a parable," um, which is wonderfully axiomatic. And I think what that means is every plague novel is really about something other than the plague. Right, that the plague is this vehicle that, by which we understand politics, by which we understand other kinds of social questions and conflict. Um, and even in antiquity, this is the case. The plague is a way we understand God mm -hmm. in Exodus. The plague um, uh, in Oedipus Rex is the self. It's, it's, it's the human being, right? I am the plague that has been brought into the city, he says. Um, the actor is standing on stage as a plague. Um, and, uh, so, and is experiencing this crisis of, of, of self-knowledge. Yeah. Um, so I don't, I don't know that we can separate them out. I mean, I guess we could <laughs> if we were incredibly disciplined, but 
I, I think there's a rich body of imaginative um, thinking and, and art um, that has been um, making these connections for, for thousands of years now um, that seems to resonate with people and, and is a way to think through uh, some of the deepest problems and questions that we face. Yeah, and I, that, that really resonates with me. And I was not just thinking this, this metaphor, it's, and maybe it could be in an, in an avenue to rationalize what is sometimes utterly irrational. And how else do you do that? Metaphor. Maybe we'll end with another uh, metaphor. Um, since we, since we, we have been talking about kind of social upheaval and societal change as one of the themes um, and, and we've, and we've touched a little bit on what the new normal might be and, and what things might look like in the future. Um, we have a question about the importance of, um, um, you know, creating things, you know, building things, um, writing, imagining a new society, you know, the sort of role of art at this moment, you know, so, so. So uh, maybe some final thoughts on what, what uh, we can build. Uh, and maybe if you want to speak to that in a metaphorical way about society, but maybe there are um, internal, personal um, you know, habits or um, habits of mind or, or habits of the heart or something else that you know, we need to be building or sort of focusing on. But, but it's just a very interesting sort of question that that the sort of creation of something can help us to persevere, but also to help us to build a sort of new future. So, so maybe we'll sort of end on an optimistic note and allow each of you to talk about, you know, that notion of creation or trying to create something new. Who's going first? I'll go first so I get it out of the way. <laughs> <laughs> not it, not it, not it. Um, you know, I'm, I'm a writer and I've spent these last three months um, writing almost nothing, you know, besides emails and, and, and that kind of thing for, you know, my daily life because uh, I think for a lot of reasons, the, probably the, the first one is that my kids are home all the time, um, climbing all over me. I have two small children, so it's not... Uh, I don't have any work time right now um, to get my to get my writing done. But, you know, there was a lot of um, sort of jokes, I guess, flying around uh, social media when this first began that Shakespeare uh, uh, in the in the year of Lear, it's called in 1606, when plague had closed the theaters in London. Um, Shakespeare went home and, to, you know, I, we assume to his flat in the city and he wrote King Lear. Uh, when everyone was quarantined and, and, you know, getting sick and losing loved ones, Shakespeare wrote King Lear. I believe he also wrote a draft of Macbeth. Um, mm. Some absurdity like that, right? Uh, and this was sort of circulating in, uh, in social media as a kind of like, first as inspiration, like, come on, guys, we can do it. You know, Shakespeare wrote Lear during, during his quarantine. And then it became, as social media tends to do, it became a kind of, you know, ironic thing to post. Like, come on, guys, where's your King Lear? Um, I certainly haven't been able to put any expectations on myself to be, um, to be disciplined and, and um, um, producing the, the, the kind of creative work that, um, that I'm interested in, in making during this time just because of pra very practical reasons and because psychologically it's very, very hard to, um, you know, uh, to get this solitude and, and serenity, I think, that, that we need to, to make art right now. Um, said, you know, I'm, I'm hungry for that. <laughs> I'm, I'm ready to get to work. Um, and, and I think that this, this, this work of building solidarity, of building community, of, of fighting for a more just world as we move out of the, you know, the coronavirus crisis and as we're still um, as deep as ever in, um, in the uh, crisis of, of racial injustice in this country, I feel like that work uh, has to also be creative, has to be, um, you know, um, 
work that we uh, that we take on as uh, as um, as meaningful and important as anything we do. So that's where I'll end it tonight. Thanks, our, uh, oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. I'll, uh, I'll, I'll allow myself to be optimistic in this sense, in that I'm gonna, I'll challenge the premise of that question. You know, especially uh, us here as academics, our value gets measured by what we produce. How many pages did you write today? How many articles have you published? What did you do this year? All right. Uh, if my publisher is listening, I'm frantically many pages a day, many pages. But I think if we're going to talk about new ways of thinking that might come come out of this entire experience, maybe it's the understanding that value doesn't have to be measured by doing anything. We don't have to be creative in a way that is resulting in something. I think this is an opportunity to find value in simply being. And I know that is going to sound whatever, but I, I think there is actually something there, especially in this modern world where we've been frantically pushed and socialized to do, 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 do. And finally, we've been called to do nothing. And that's my optimism, that we can make peace with that and um, find joy in just being and not doing. I'll end it there. Thank you. Joe? Not a bad cleanup here. So I was going to mention making sourdough bread. I was making something. I was being creative. I was playing into that stereotype. Um, but no, I mean, I, I, Tate's you know, going to be chair. And I, you know, Tim, as chair of history, you handed out many of those stickers that said history matters. And it's confronting our history. It's knowing our history. And, you know, Tate just showing that slide of the uh, Memphis martyrs. I didn't know that story before I came to Memphis. I didn't even know about the yellow fever. And what I'll be doing is reminding people who are maybe a little upset and unconvinced about the protest. And uh, they need to be reminded that uh, these people, African-Americans came to the aid of this city in a time of crisis. And it can be our part to remind people of that and just say, focus on that, okay? Focus on those stories, okay? There's plenty of stuff I'm sure you can point into the historical record. They did this, they did that. Let's focus on the positive and maybe as a mantra, just say that in your head over and over again and maybe you'll convince a few people. I gotta be optimistic. Thank you. I'm, I'm so glad we could end on a hopeful note. I wanna thank all of our panelists, Joe Jansen, um, Chris Brunt, Tate Keller, and a special thanks to Jeff Bakewell, the director of the Neiman Center, for organizing all of this for us. And also to Matt Guerin, the executive director of um, communications here at uh, Rhodes College. Once again, it's my pleasure to uh, say I'm so glad that you were part of this uh, program tonight. And uh, uh, wanted to mention again, next week, this same time, 7 o'clock Central Time next Wednesday, session hosted by our own president, Dr. Marjorie Haas, and uh, we look forward to that. Thank you thank all. Thank you, Tim. Thank you for doing this. It was great. All right. Great. Thanks.